My name is uh, Tony McDonald and I represent Australia and 10 other members, including six Pacific Island members on the Asian Development Bank Board of Directors. I'm honoured to be your moderator at, for this event, the last event of ADB's first hybrid annual meeting. Over the course of the past week of events, you will have heard many times of ADB's ambition to be the climate bank for Asia and the Pacific. As President Masa Asakawa says, the battle against climate change will be won or lost in Asia and the Pacific. Asia and the Pacific is now responsible for more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions. And as we are increasingly seeing, Asia and the Pacific is also highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, especially in small island developing states and the most vulnerable populations. ADB has an ambitious target to reach $100 billion in climate financing by 2030. As large as this number sounds, it is still only a fraction of the investment that will be needed to meet the challenges ahead, highlighting the critical importance of innovative financial approaches. This afternoon, we have brought forward a diverse panel of distinguished speakers from donors, developing member countries and the private sector to provide their expert perspective on how innovative finance can help win the battle against climate change and how we can address the challenges and pathways for innovation. With eight members on the panel, an indication of the, how much interest there is in this issue, we will have two rounds of interventions from panel members, with each panel member speaking for three minutes and a follow-up discussion. And hopefully at the end, we will have time to take a couple of questions from the audience as well. Instructions on how to submit questions are on the screen or somewhere. Now, to begin the discussion, it is my honour to introduce Kentaro Ogata, Deputy Vice Minister for International Affairs at the Ministry of Finance of Japan. Over to you, Kentaro. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's quite an honor for me to, to be on the panel uh, for these important discussions. Um, three minutes is really short, but uh, let me try. Um, in, in opening, I, I think that the, I would like to, to argue that the uh, tackling climate change is not only a challenge, but it provides the opportunities. The, uh, in the past several uh, days, the, we have discussed the compounding challenges that the, the member countries face. And one could argue that the, you know, the, it is not the, the appropriate time to, to address the climate change, but it's not true. The, uh, my argument is that the climate change would provide uh, opportunity for countries to grow. And then it, it is opportunity because the, the tackling climate change is about uh, making a new type of investment. You have to invest in uh, new, new uh, alternative, uh, less, uh, less CO2 emitting uh, alternatives. You have to invest in the new technologies, new clean, green technologies. So the, um, those are the new types of technology uh, investments. Of course, the investments will not uh, come automatically. You, the countries need to prepare for the new, new investment. Uh, so it has uh, own things to do. But the, once the, they, they have created an environment conducive to those new types of investment, that would be the, uh, uh, quite a good uh, uh, basis for the sustainable uh, resilient growth, and the future is the basis for uh, tackling all the other challenges. So the, um, it is a very opportune time for the countries to invest in climate change. Um, as the climate change is the opportunity, uh, and it is the development policy for the member countries, the develop member countries have to develop their own strategies. So the strategy has to be country-owned. It has to be consistent with their other development uh, priorities. Um, and then in doing so, they, they would uh, um, draw a, a scientifically supported ambitious transition path. And then that involves uh, lots of uh, uh, new technologies and uh, new funding. So that, that, that's where the, the, we, the donor comes in. Uh, 
um, we are the one who has to support the, uh, the technologies and also the financing. But here the, the financial support is not, should not be the mere transfer of the financial resources. It has to be the, uh, our, our support for the, the, the development strategies. And then I would like to touch briefly on the, uh, the G7 initiative, JETP, Just Energy Transition Partnership. Uh, the, the one of the successful cases will be the Indonesian JETP. Uh, JETP uh, is a platform where the, the donors will have the, uh, the discussions with the partner countries. In the in Indonesian JETP case, it's the Indonesian government. There we will be uh, di discussing uh, with the Indonesian government that the, uh, the scope for them to augment their uh, ambitions in the transition path. They, they have their national uh, uh, strategies already, but the, the point is that the, they should be as ambitious as possible. All the member countries should uh, be, be aiming at achieving the global goal of 1.5 degree. And then, as I mentioned, that that will be the basis for their, their uh, the future growth, um, but you know, the, uh, the, the, there are always a room for more ambition. But of course, the more ambition uh, needs to the, the technology transfer and the, the financial support. So we will dis discuss those issues with the, the partner countries, and then we will find the way uh, to augment their ambitions. And then I, I think uh, with the support from the co-lead country, United States, the Alexia and the her team has uh, provided uh, tremendous uh, contributions to the, the JTP. And because of a strong uh, partnership, I think we have successfully uh, convinced that the, the Indonesian government that the, there is a room for uh, becoming more ambition, uh, more ambitious. And also the JETP is a partnership for the donor coordination as well. Uh, the idea is that the, in the traditional, uh, as in the traditional uh, coordination platform, the donors should coordinate amongst themselves so that the, each individual countries would not harass the recipient country's government. They have the, uh, the limit in the capacity. So we have discussed among, amongst uh, uh, the, the, the donors, and that I think is really important exercise for ourselves. We found the divergent views among the, the donors. So the, through this uh, coordination platform, we have uh, find out that the best way for the donors to help the, the recipient countries. And then through the, the communication dialogue with the recipient countries, uh, we have found the ways to augment the, the ambition. So th those are the uh, important platform. Uh, and then I, I think that the, we can replicate this success in Indonesia in the other uh, countries. And then that could contribute to the uh, uh, glo global climate change uh, uh, in the bus, as well as the helping the, uh, the countries to uh, have more robust uh, um, uh, growth strategy. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kentaro. Um, our next panelist is uh, Caleb Adui, um, the governor for Palau in the ADB and Minister of Finance and the current Chair of the Pacific DMC Governors. Over to you, Governor. Thank you, Tony. It's my pleasure to be here today to provide you with a Pacific DMC perspective of how innovative finance can help with the battle against climate change. <coughs> the indicators in the recent Asian Development Outlook are clear that the Pacific SIDS were the hardest hit from the pandemic and were projected to be the last to recover Having said that, we must not lose sight that climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of the peoples of the Blue Pacific and across developing member countries. It is critical that we limit global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees to keep us above water. Development partners must do all they can to assist large DMCs in the region in their climate mitigation efforts. Pacific SIDS always had a very minimal carbon footprint globally, but are already facing ex existential threats to climate events. We are past mitigation. There is a need for much more support for climate adaptation projects that are essential to building the resilience of Pacific SIDS to climate events. This is also why the issue of loss and damage is so important to Pacific SIDS. 
It is not something we can keep kicking down the road just because it is uncomfortable for developed countries to discuss. Highly vulnerable small island states need more concessional, concession, sorry, concessional climate financing resources to address country-specific vulnerabilities. However, the excessive focus on the Gross National Income Per Capita Index has precluded some of the most vulnerable small island countries from full, fully accessing concessional resources, particularly grant financing. Financing should reflect the uh, situation and need and not just deepen existing debt burdens in this regard. While we welcome the innovative fi climate finance approaches that ADB and other development partners are developing, let me make two points. First, innovative financing should be a way of leveraging additional resources to tackle climate change over and above existing commitments, such as the long-standing but as yet unmet commitment of developed members to contribute $100 billion per annum in climate finance and not a way to make it easier for them to achieve this commitment. There is uh, private money available, as shown by the commitments made in the Our Oceans Conference held in Palau earlier this year. Second, developing members must have ownership on where and how climate finance is used in their countries, especially when leveraging other resources, such as those funds for food security. We welcome ADB's increased climate finance ambition of 100 billion by 2030, but just as important as the volume of support is its quality. The needs are so great that we need to ensure that climate finance has maximum impact on the ground and for our people. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Our next speaker, Maria Teresa Zapia, is the Chief Impact Officer and Blended Finance Officer and Deputy CEO of Blue Orchid. Maria Teresa joins us virtually to provide a private sector perspective. Over to you, Maria Teresa. Good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'd like to give some, uh, let's say, positive uh, news on, on the interest of private sector for, you know, climate finance. As you know, Blue Orchard is part of the Schroders Group. And I'd like to say that in over, over the past 18 months, we have received nothing else than interest from pension funds, family offices, foundations, who are actually having climate-aligned portfolios. So as the speakers before have said, this of course is particularly important uh, for the Asia Pacific region, but uh, we, we see indeed that there is a lot of interest. Now investors are looking at this from different perspectives. They have interest in, of course, climate mitigation strategy, climate adaptation, and more recently, we have also seen a lot of interest on nature-based solutions. Um, investors have clearly an appetite uh, overall for climate finance and as well for climate finance in emerging markets where the challenges are the biggest. So we see a big role for development finance institutions, bilateral governments in actually provide, providing concessional capital. As indicated in the recent uh, convergence study, over 2015 and 2019, there has been an incredible use of concessional capital in blended finance structures, where $1 of concessional capital has been able to leverage as much as $4 of commercial capital. So we are clearly looking at blended finance as an instrument and a mean to attract large institutional private sector investors in blended finance for climate finance. And Blue Orchard and Schroders have been successful in doing this and we'll be really happy to showcase you know, our experience in order to leverage and unlock even more private capital, a scale in particularly for the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we turn to um, Rachel 
Uh, our final panellist in the first round of interventions is Rachel Turner, Director of the International Finance Directorate at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the UK. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much and also delighted to be here and uh, pleased to follow on from uh, the private sector piece particularly. What I wanted to do was just to uh, obviously absolutely acknowledge the clear <coughs> and extremely urgent needs to scale up financing and to deliver that financing with high impact. Uh, and of course, to applaud the 100 billion commitment from the Asia Bank, but also just to put out three uh, proposals, challenges, ideas for how we can get maximum impact and maximum leverage through the multilateral development bank system. And, um, the first of those is really a challenge to the business model. So Maria spoke about leverage rates of one to four. Well, I think we need in this room to, you know, is one to four good enough? Or, uh, and have we set ourselves those targets high enough? Uh, and at the heart of that, I think, is the issue about whether we settle on a multilateral development bank business model that is based on originate, invest, and hold, holding assets is nice, you get a steady income stream, you know where you are as shareholders, or do we push the system very fast into originate, build, construct, and release and sell on to the capital markets and recycle and start again? And I think that fundamental question about the MDB business model is the one we really got to put in front of us and start to tackle. And part of that is about how we make the, so this is my second point about how we make the connections between the MDB business model and the listed tradable markets. And in the UK, we've been running a capital markets competition called Mobilist that takes assets out of current closed funds and MDB systems and with our anchoring support takes them through to listing and trading on the stock exchanges. So I think there's a second challenge there about can we begin to, again, move assets through to listing, recycle and achieve scale. And I think the third point I wanted to make is about the power of reinsurance. And uh, you know, I'm sure Maria will have views on this, but uh, we've seen the G20 capital adequacy review, which we think is a very strong review, which has a range of recommendations for the international financial system to boost uh, capital from their balance sheets. And one point it makes very strongly is that the power of the reinsurance markets is being underused. And I think there are two parts to that. One is the role of reinsurance in de-risking. We talk a lot about using very scarce grant capital for first loss anchor. That is expensive. Could we be buying that first loss provision from better shaped reinsurance offers? And the second is about the exciting use of reinsurance to take risk off existing portfolios. And I wanted to congratulate the Asia Bank for having been one of the first banks to uh, do that with a very exciting, I think it's called the very exciting uh, name of the master agreement. I think we need a new name for that. Uh, to take a billion of financial sector loans, uh, take those to the markets, reinsure and immediately free up capital. So there's something there about reinsurance that I think we really need to put on the table. So three ideas from me, thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And, and thank you to all of our first round of panelists for getting the discussion off to a really good start. We will pause the panel interventions there for the moment to allow for a couple of follow-up questions from me. Um, time is limited, so I would ask uh, each panel member to speak for two minutes in response. Uh, my first question I'll put to uh, three panelists, first Kentaro Ogato, then Maria Teresa, uh, and then uh, Caleb Udui. Our meeting today is held against the backdrop of a rapidly shifting global landscape with multifaceted challenges in tackling cost of living, energy and food security, inflation and a potential global recession. How do you see ADB's role as Asia and the Pacific's climate bank to tackle climate change and lead Asia's transition to net zero and climate resilience? Kentaro. Yes, um, thank you very much for that, uh, that uh, important question. 
I, I think I mostly answered your question in my first intervention. The, the, the short answer is that the, since the, uh, the investment in the, uh, the climate change issue is uh, exactly the development policy, is the growth strategy. Uh, so the, the ADP, uh, it is very opportune time for the ADP to actually support the member countries to invest more on the climate change uh, issues. And then to do so, um, of course, the, the, we need ADB needs uh, more financing capacity. It has the knowledge capacity, but it needs more financing capacity. So it is uh, very right uh, for ADB to come up with uh, uh, innovative uh, vehicle to, to augment their financing firepower. The one is the, the ETM energy transition mechanism. Uh, just like the JetP, JetP is the partnership to, to help countries to decommission a coal-fired plant as well as to, to encourage the investment on the renewables. The ETM is uh, the, the vehicle to uh, do exactly the same thing, the, to, to help the, the countries to decommission the coal plants and also to encourage the investments in the renewables. Uh, we, Japan is the first donor to contribute to the, the ETM. We uh, committed uh, 25 million uh, to that. I'm hoping that the other countries to, to follow. Uh, the other mechanism is the IFCAP. Um, and that's quite innovative uh, vehicle to, to get uh, resources from the, the old range of uh, contributors, including the private sector and the philanthropies. And also it has the uh, guarantee window. We, we haven't, uh, they, they, they haven't gone into the, uh, the insurance uh, field yet, but the, the encouraging the guarantee, that's the new uh, areas for enhancing the financing. So the, this is really innovative uh, Cool. And so the, I support the ADBs become being uh, that innovative. Thank you. Thank you, Kentaro. Now we go to Maria Teresa. The same question, please. Thank you very much. So I think ADB has a very key role, of course, not only in Asia Pacific region, but overall globally in climate. I want to stress this because certainly one thing that could really amplify the the, the, the financial uh, you know, power of ADB would be really to th start thinking about climate as a global topic and so really expand even farther beyond its own countries of operation as climate is uh, really a global topic and cannot in its full extent be, uh, if you want, dealt with at the regional um, level. Um, and uh, so I would encourage to, you know, when, uh, when ADB thinks about uh, unlocking private capital to think global as opposed to only regional. Um, the, other, the other ways that we really believe that ADB could be active is as we have, for example, worked um, already in climate finance over the past 10 years meaning that we have been able to structure um, you know, uh, private market funds in climate adaptation and climate mitigation thanks to uh, first loss, uh, technical assistance, and also in some cases uh, what we call premium uh, support facilities. So we've been able to use, if you want, a full uh, toolkit of you know, the risking measures be it in, uh, you know, uh, as I said, in the first loss cushion. And so providing pension funds and uh, really a, a large range of investors with the capacity to invest, you know, in, uh, in a senior position, but also really capacity building and technical assistance. I think this is an important topic, especially as we think about you know, creating investment ready projects uh, in, uh, in both in climate resilience, in climate insurance, as been said before, and in climate mitigation. I think technical assistance capacity building have really a, a very large role to play. And even if we think, for example, in new asset classes like uh, natural capital, uh, you know, preparing uh, uh, natural-based solutions, investment project would also be important. So really, essentially, what we would like to, to see is really an active role of ADB in partnering and, and collaborating with, um, you know, a, a large range of investors that, are, as, as I said in my opening statement, 
are in fact very interested in investment opportunities in climate finance globally. Thank you. Thank you. And now we turn to uh, our governor from Palau. Thank you, Tony. Very interesting to see the different perspectives, and I guess as a, a DMC, I, I'll give you a different one, different perspective. You know, I think, uh, at least from uh, those of us in the Pacific, ADB is, is really our uh, primary partner for us. It's, uh, and we look to ADB for leadership, uh, not just for finance, but also in policy advice and technical assistance to meet the climate change challenge. Um, this will require ADB to invest more in deepening and widening staff expertise on climate change. ADB can play a critical role in leveraging climate finance. ADB has a strong track record of acting as an accredited entity of the Green Climate Fund, playing a critical role in helping the region unlock access to the GCF, which is becoming increasingly difficult to access, at least for on our part. We recognize that it is labor intensive for ADB staff, but it is a role that ADB is uniquely well placed to play in the region, and one we are finding difficult to make ourselves. ADB's private sector operations offer the opportunity to demonstrate the feasibility of challenging projects in frontier markets. Blended finance, including from the ADF 13 pilot private sector window, offers the opportunity to unlock significant amounts of private sector climate finance. But progress to date has been slow. Finally, ADB should review how it takes account of the vulnerability of SIDS to provide greater access to consensual finance to respond to climate events. Climate change for us is disruptive. We can reduce volatility through resiliency funds, and that's what we are trying to do in Palau. We also need to focus on rapid response mechanisms and hybrid approaches like what we used during the pandemic. And I think we need to keep our focus on the people and those who are most vulnerable. I think ADB can help us do that. Thank you, Governor, and thank you all panelists. Um, my second question goes to uh, Rachel Turner, and I'll also ask you, Governor, to come in on this one as well to provide a GMC perspective. While there seems to be a general consensus around meeting nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans, as always, translating plans into action is challenging. So let me ask you this. Where do you think developing member countries need support in meeting NDCs and national uh, NNAPS? And where and how can donors most effectively pro provide that support? Rachel, over to you. Yeah, that, thank you, and, and that's probably the most important question, actually, in this debate. <laughs> that's, no, no, but uh, thank you. I mean, the first thing I would say, I think, is to respond to the point about how difficult it remains to access some of the global climate funds. And uh, that just has to be an imperative to work that through. And it needs to be solved, and it needs to be solved quickly. And I think all of us need to understand why it's so difficult and what we can do to improve it. And I think um, one of the things I wanted to draw attention to, we've spoken a lot, and we hear a lot about the jet peas in the mitigation space, and we are very strong supporters of the jet peas. But at Glasgow, also launched was the Climate Finance Access Task Force, with five countries under the chair of Fiji to really drive improvements to allow the vulnerable countries to find it easier to access finance. And one of the key issues there is on the fiscal public finance side about how to reach a point in which countries can enter the bond markets particularly to access low-cost fi low finance through the bond markets for certifi certified against the quality of their NDCs. So the financial architecture is used to the use of proceed bonds. And as the finance minister of Fiji said to me at, at uh, COP, they're very, very difficult to manage. They create rigidities the whole way through the budget 
what you need is when you have a strong NDC and you've confidently aligned your budget to the NDC and the fact that your budget is aligned to your NDC has been assured and certified, that needs to give you value in entering into the bond market. And that's a piece that I think all of us in this room are trying to work on, trying to move through as we move to COP27 at Egypt to make it easier for the countries to access streamlined, fast dispersing, low cost green financing into the fiscal space with a strong ability to finance adaptation. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Rachel. And uh, Governor, uh, over to you for any thoughts. Yeah, I'll vote for that, Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you would. Thank you. <laughs> I'll make three points. First, that adaptation financing and resilience is, is critical for Pacific DMCs. This needs finance and technical assistance and expertise, especially when we, we try to access these uh, mechanisms. Second, we know from experience that if countries are faced with a choice between energy security and climate action, they will choose the former, which is energy. So those of us who want more ambitious climate action need to find ways for DMCs to take climate action that is consistent with and enhances their energy security and economic development objectives. Third, as I noted before, country ownership in the transition process is critical if change is to be truly just and sustained. You know, I believe uh, help is needed to facilitate the action on the ground Delivery that is simple and direct. Uh, ADB country offices, um, in my experience, are good focal points, as they are uh, NGOs and government-to-government -government collaborations facilitated by ADB. Uh, there is an opportunity to help projects on the ground already in play, rather than figure out what new projects we can create and how fancy we can make them. Finally, a, a rapid response modality is needed to make up for lost time, as, as you I just said. So I, I think these are very important uh, ways that we can make a difference in this area. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. And we now turn to the second round of interventions from our remaining panel members who have been waiting very patiently and listening very attentively to the first round of discussion. It is my honor to introduce Alexia Latorte, Assistant Secretary for International Trade and Development at the United States Department of the Treasury. Over to you, Alexia. Thank you, thank you so much, Tony. A lot has been said, so I think the case uh, for the urgency of climate has been made, so I won't uh, belabor it. I will echo Quintero in saying that it's an opportunity, not just a challenge. And I would also go further to say that those who talk about a tension or a choice or a dichotomy between development finance and climate finance, I think are not on the winning team. I think uh, uh, we should not focus on false tensions. I think we need to do both. And I think one without the other, uh, frankly, doesn't work. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear up front. Now, to meet the challenge, uh, the sheer scale of finance needed is overwhelming. You can also earn to the opportunity point as well by being part of the future, but to get to the transition, I think, is, is what we're talking about. And there we have lots of tools. So we have regulation, we have taxation, we have finance, direct finance, and we're focusing a bit more on the direct finance piece today, but I just wanted to acknowledge that we actually have lots of different levers, and certainly, for example, in the US, we just, with the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, are using, you know, taxation quite a bit, you know, we're using, frankly, subsidies a fair bit as well to try and spark and create demand in certain areas. Now, on the finance bit, I think, you know, not only is the sheer of fine, the, the scale of finance huge, but I think we have to look at the concessionality of finance, the form of finance, so what kind of instruments. Rachel talked a lot about insurance, and I would subscribe to that. And then I think we really need to be talking about domestic resources, we need to be talking about public sector finance, and we need to be talking about private sector finance. And some of the examples that Quintero explained for me, so I don't have to, um, both in terms of what ADB is doing, which really I think is innovative, like fundamentally innovative, which is not always the case in MDB world, if we're frank, um, you know, with the um, IFCAP and with ETM, you know, 
um, are really powerful because they're bringing different sort of flows of finance together. There's an ability for the private sector to come in, the MDB finance to come in, even the philanthropic finance to come in, and, and aligning that finance towards a goal of greater ambition, climate ambition, I think is really the power of, of these models. But you sort of outlined them, so I won't other than to say it's pretty radical. And, and sorry, no, I do have to do one, one more asterisk on ETM, I think. What's also amazing is an MDB being a first mover in terms of financing to decommission coal, which is really complicated and, 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 and tricky. So I just wanted to, to underscore that that's the kind of things we need to be talking about. Um, you know, Rachel mentioned the business model of the MDBs needing to evolve, and we've been doing work together actually with Rachel and with Kentaro as well on this. And frankly, I, I just want to underscore that I think it's really important. The business model, the operational approach, the incentives, right? So if we're really trying to have the MDBs help on climate, where we're now in a world that's very different from sort of run-of-the-mill project financing, where the costs of an action may be with a country, but the benefits accrue not only to that country, which is the definition, right, of a public good. The costs can accrue regionally, or to Maria Teresa's point, globally, so also think globally, even in the context of the ADB, I think if that's the world we're in, which we are, I think we have to think about the incentives differently. And so it means, you know, thinking through, um, do I need to keep my lens as an MDB always to be country income as the driver for what I, how I think about what kind of financing a country gets? To a different world, we're saying it actually maybe depends on the kind of activity that I'm trying to finance, and depending on that, I may need different tenure, different concessionality, et cetera. That's pretty radical in MDB world, including for us shareholders. But I think we have to challenge ourselves to, to think in a more sophisticated way. And I think listening to the governor um, here as well, integrating in eligibility and allocation calculations, new dimensions, including potentially vulnerability. Right, because we've talked about the importance of adaptation and resilience. Well, then that maybe we need to account into that when we think about eligibility as well. And then I just want to end uh, maybe on 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 um, private capital mobilization because I was very excited to hear Maria Teresa and all the interest that she's getting and all the ESG you know money you know. Um, but I also want to have with ambition a dose of pragmatism. Because if we look at where um, you know, some of the funders that I work with, the GFANS members are, the number of developing countries that they're in or able to work in or have sort of you know, approved credit uh, possibilities to work in is, is not huge. It's, it's the same number. It's the same emerging markets over and over. So you hear India, you hear, but you don't necessarily hear you know, Palau. And, and so I think we need to be ambitious but very, very clear about what it will take to leverage in and mobilize um, international private capital um, into certain markets, which is why I think we also need to work on, you know, domestically also local currency solutions, for example, that are really important. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Alexia. Our next panelist is Tony Yulo Loizaga. Secretary of the Philippines Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Over to you, Secretary. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm going to pick up on the conversation from uh, Caleb and the conversation on vulnerability and adaptation and how important that is to countries like ours. So let me just say that uh, I wish to thank the ADB um, for inviting us to this panel and supporting urgent and immediate as well as long-term actions we in the Asia-Pacific need in order to avoid contributing to global tipping points, uh, but also while addressing our country's risks. The Philippines ranks fourth in the Global Climate Risk Index among countries most affected between 20, 2000 and 2019. It also ranks fourth between 20, 2000 and 2019 in terms of the number of disasters that have occurred per country. We are one of the lowest contributors to, to greenhouse gas emissions globally, but like our fellow nations in the Asia Pacific, we suffer loss and damage to climate hazards. In our case, an average perhaps of about 0.5% of GDP, but that can reach all the way up to 4.5% of GDP in incidences like, say, Typhoon Haiyan. 
Uh, recently, a study was, was published where in about 30 of our leading provinces are most susceptible to storm surge, similar to what has happened in Typhoon Haiyan. And these figures, as I mentioned, do not take into account the indirect long-term impacts on livelihoods and displacement of the most vulnerable in the country. So they must also be viewed within the context of compound hazards, wherein we have situations wherein you have a pandemic, but then a climate-related extreme event is actually occurring and is actually impacting the country. Or cascading ones, like natural technological ones, wherein we have an extreme event and our technological systems fail. The impacts of that medium term, immediate and long term, on ecosystems, on communities, on food security and public health. All of these are not taken into consideration. So the greatest importance on transitions, uh, investments in energy transition and transport are investments that are very important, but vulnerable communities and the ecosystems that support them require preventive investments and actions today, not responses but preventive investments. So we often discuss investments and benefits in terms of early warning for early action, and that's one of the most, I guess, uh, well-discussed topics. But there's growing understanding in terms of using what we call the last mile in those discussions, and what we must make the first mile, which are the people who are being affected by these hazards. This really means for us, in terms of uh, our task moving forward, Emissions reductions through energy transition actually require also two more tasks that must be at the forefront of climate action. The first one is understanding that the hazards we know must be also looked at in terms of what might be possible in the future, in terms of what might come because of climate change. And secondly, unpacking differentiated and intersecting vulnerabilities to inform adaptation and disaster risk reductions and actions are equally important. Countries like the Philippines that have, are exposed to multiple hazards need to manage our resources to grow our economies. But we need to work with development partners to look beyond structural investments and to support our work with nature as well. Our transition journeys include measuring what we value through a natural capital accounting system that we hope to put in place, incorporating the management and enhancement of our ecosystems into nature-based, as well as combined green, blue, gray solutions to address climate risk. Our experience so far with the ADB, uh, in terms of the policy-based loan support that has been given, is in its early stages, and we look forward to exploring how this, in fact, may be, may be invested so that they may have the impact that we desire on the most vulnerable. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Our next panelist is Niels Anand, Governor for Germany in the ADB and Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Over to you, Governor. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Thank you um, for um, giving me the opportunity. I. Uh, it's hard not to repeat too much of what has been said. So let me maybe focus a little bit on the question of social protection and the need to manage the necessary energy transition. Um, I think if I look at the experience that we made with our partner countries and developing, and that, Tony, I guess is the core question, what innovative financial solution can offer, uh, developing instruments like the already mentioned jet piece, but of course here at the um, annual meeting of the Asian Development Bank, the ETM, um, that offers us already a lot of insights that um, are necessary, I think, to develop models that we can apply in different regions of this planet. And I'm sure that you share my expectation that COP27, starting in just in a few days, will um, hopefully promote that discussion. But it's not only about developing countries or the LDCs. 
it is also a question that we have in a way experienced and we are still experiencing in our own energy transition in Germany. So in a way, if you look at, for example, the legislation, and that was very difficult, sometimes even messy process. The legislation that we passed, um, which gives us the legal foundation for the phasing out of coal in Germany. Now, we are experiencing a certain setback right now because of Russia's war, and I mean, it seems that they virtually blew up the energy pipelines. Let's see where this is getting through. But, but we will remain on that track, and we use that legislation to provide funds for the affected communities in Germany, where so many jobs depend directly on fossil energies. And of course you could say Germany is a rich country, which is true, and we want to maintain that prosperity, I can assure you. But even for us it was difficult. And my experience is also talking with my colleagues in Parliament. When we ask them to provide us with the necessary funds, to help with those energy transition projects. Um, that is something where they can rely on their own experience. And so I believe if we look at um, the instruments that we are right now developing, and if, if we look at um, the economic crisis that we are trying to deal with right now, the question of social protection is more than just an instrument to offer to affected communities. I would say um, it should go hand in hand, even in a close cooperation with what we are doing in terms of disaster um, risk management. Um, because we also see when economic crisis hit, a well-developed social protection system um, provides us with more flexibility with automatic stabilizers and sometimes with an infrastructure that we can build upon uh, in order to give us more room to maneuver to manage the crisis. And I completely agree with everybody on the panel who mentioned that the demands are so enormous that I could not imagine how we will be able to finance that only with official development assistance. It's simply not going to happen. And that's why I believe um, ADB, the other development banks, the World Bank, um, and the private sector um, need to become even more innovative. We don't have much time to lose. Um, and we see um, at least, and I can, can relate to what Maria Teresa said, we see a willingness and in some cases even an expectation also from shareholders of big companies to perform as well. So I would say huge challenges ahead of us, but it's not only you know, governmental institution, multilateral institution, it is a private sector as well, and we need to mobilize that potential. I, I leave it with that. Thank you, Governor. Our final panelist from the second round of interventions is uh, Ivan Falella, a coordinator of the Climate Change and Sustainability Hub at the Banca d'Italia. Ivan joins us virtually to provide a central banker perspective. Over to you, Ivan. Thanks. Uh, first, thanks a lot for the invitation. A very interesting discussion. Uh, well, I, I would like to dwell a bit on what uh, Caleb and Maria Antonia were uh, uh, underlying regarding the importance of loss and damages. I mean, we could say that if the issue of climate finance is often the elephant in the room, uh, maybe loss and damage is the dinosaur in the room. No, it's, it's something that is important. There is not a great definition. There are economic or non-economic effects. And this damage, uh, you know, I think we can say are already having negative effects on ecosystem infrastructure. So there are economic effects as well as non-economic effects. How much money we're talking about? According to David 20, so this coalition of the world's most climate vulnerable countries, uh, these countries lost an estimated incredible amount of money. I mean, it's 525 billion in the last 20 years. And there is an estimate that these uh, costs could uh, come up uh, as high as uh, 1 trillion by 2050 per year. 
So that, that, that's really a huge amount of money. It's an order of magnitude more than climate finance. And, and we know also that with climate finance, uh, we had an issue. This issue has been on, on international negotiations since 1991, so it's, it's not new, but you know, it's, it's contentious. Uh, I think the point obviously here is that the fear from one side of advanced countries of, of having a kind of unlimited liabilities because these things are going out of control. And from the other side, as we, uh, as we heard before, the issue that you know, th these things are happening now, so, uh, and these are costs, it's, it's even difficult to estimate the cost. So I, I don't want to go into the thorny uh, international negotiation issues of uh, what's, what, what, how we can solve this issue. Let's say developing countries are say, uh, unlimited liabilities maybe are poss possibility because there is not an agreement, an international agreement. From the other side, you know, there are some recent moves, for example, I think that Vanuatu and other countries, they go to the International Court of Justice to ask for compensation. And so these this things is clearly an issue. I think that can be an issue, interesting issue to discuss during the COP27, during the talks in Bonn, uh, again, uh, the, there was this attempt to put the, the, this issue on the agenda, uh, and I think it's important uh, that they exactly put the things that will be in the agenda of uh, COP27. I read these matters relating of, to funding arrangements for addressing loss and damage. So. Uh, and there are, we know there are mechanisms uh, to discuss this. There's the Glasgow Dialogue, there is the Santiago Network for the technical issues. So I think it's important continue to discuss these things. There is some things moving, you know, apart from the Scotland and, and the, the Wallonia region, there was a, a voluntary contribution for loss of damage. Very recently, I think Denmark provided uh, uh, something like around 10 million euros exactly. Pro specifically for loss and damage. Uh, so there is something moving on. Uh, Denmark is the first country, U UN country, uh, providing such resources. Uh, I conclude saying, uh, I mean, we are talking in, a, in, a, in M with a, within a context uh, organized by MDB. What is the role of MDB? Well, I think that the risk re reduction uh, facilities and recovery facilities are really important. I know that this issue is crossing a bit adaptation resources. We also know from, there was a nice IMF paper recently on scaling up green finance underlying that, that we really need more finance towards adaptation. We can start working, uh, having bright idea. There is, for example, the, the, the disaster response fund by ADB, I think is an excellent example of this kind of instruments. As Caleb was saying, both in terms of finance, but in terms of, of capacity building of response strategies and this kind of technical stuff that are really important. And we can imagine that there is a, we, we can take a path where we have in more resources for adaptation and that can be a first step discussing also for resources for uh, to compensate for loss and damage. We know that contribution science, contribution to climate change is now is developing a lot, uh, but you know, still we have a, a lot of issues. Uh, imagine uh, regarding hurricanes, the, the literature is, 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 uh, is, is not providing a, a, with one voice a single response. As I think Maria Antonia was underlined before and other speakers, there is also this issue that, you know, historical data are sometimes not enough to, uh, to forecast what's, what's going to happen because the, the, the climate cycle is changing so much and so quickly that maybe the, the old instruments and the old observation data are not completely uh, useful to, to forecast what's going to happen. But, you know, I think that, you know, more focus on adaptation could be a, a starting point. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, uh, Ivan, and thank you to all of our second round of panellists for maintaining the really strong momentum of the discussion, and I think there's a number of really uh, consistent themes that are coming through. Now for uh, some follow-up questions. Um, again, if panel members could keep their answers to around two minutes, uh, but I think we're running about on time. Uh, so this first question I'll put to uh, uh, Secretary Tony and then to uh, Alexia and to, and to Niels. Um, um, ADB approved its first climate finance policy-based loan earlier this year to support government's efforts to tackle climate change. Please share your insights on the importance of policy reforms for unlocking climate actions, including how they can translate to achieving more ambitious NDCs. And as that policy-based loan was in the Philippines, it's only appropriate that we start with our Philippine Secretary. Please, Tony. 
Thank you very much. Um, let me just say, to begin with, I'm about 60 days into this job. <laughs> so, so, so I wasn't part of the formulation of the policy-based loan, but, but um, just a few thoughts on that. And, and I, I did have a few queries poised to, to the Department of Finance about uh, the background on, on the formulation. I understand from them that this was intended to support our, our, bu our budget given certain terms and conditions and the way um, the, the items uh, that would be included would be framed. So the, the policy-based loan, as I understand it, um, actually applies a climate risk lens and certain targets that cover both mitigation, in this case, primarily energy transition um, away from, from coal-fired um, energy, energy efficiency and RE, uh, and clean power infrastructure. And on the adaptation side, which I think is, is you know, very interesting to me, it addresses both um, intensive and extensive risk from extreme events and uh, from seasonal and recurring events, such as, for example, the, the enhanced southwest monsoon. On policy reforms in, in general, I think at this point, um, they're absolutely necessary um, to be able to recognize that climate risk is dynamic, complex, and systemic. And it, it does have differentiated physical, financial, and social costs across different sectors and scales. So that, that, that complexity is actually what we're dealing with in, in trying to, to formulate um, the pathways forward. So strategic policy reforms can actually facilitate evidence and impact-based planning, budgeting, and accountability towards resilient and inclusive development that is both whole of government and whole of society, and I think that these two need to be part of the same coin. By targeting critical areas for emissions reduction and incremental and transformative adaptation disaster risk reduction together, um, we can actually work on how our organizational structures, priorities, and investments can be made fit for purpose. At this point, that needs to be done at the inception rather than at the end when we've actually experienced all of these um, harmful events. Policy reforms can strengthen coherence, especially in the executive and legislative agenda, and this is something that I have personally experienced working with the National Resilience Council, where you have executive and legislative agenda not necessarily working on, along the same path. Um, and that coherence really needs to extend at the national level but also between national to local, where you have policies at the national level articulated, but local level implementation that doesn't necessarily reflect that. And, and of course, related to that, the efficient use of um, resources that are limited, especially in developing countries such as ours. I, I think where it was most, it's most crucial here is its possible contribution to an information architecture within government wherein not only do we monitor, evaluate, and learn, but that is linked to revisiting, reviewing, and responding to changing conditions. And as we know, as environment is changing, our societies are changing as well. So, so the ability of, of policy reform to actually capture um, what is going on dynamically, and then translate that into investments in science, technology, innovation, as well as, of course, local action, I think, are critical. Um, perhaps lastly, in terms of the responding to, to how we can, policy reform can actually respond to more ambitious NDCs. I think at this point, um, there is an opportunity to create opportunities for funding investments that produce co-benefits. And, and those co-benefits um, can actually be in the form of, um, say valuing and preserving, growing our forests on land, mangroves and seagrass, protecting these as carbon stock, but also as, as, as they relate to ecosystem services that are much needed in terms of flood management, contributions to water, food, energy, security. So these investments today, in terms of these nature-based and combined green, blue, and gray solutions can actually accelerate adaptation, but also can contribute to emissions reduction uh, targets at the end of the day. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tony. Now to uh, Alexia. Alexia, before you were talking about financing and policy and it's been different arms, but 
policy-based lo loans are a way of, when done well, bringing those things together. So any thoughts? No, absolutely. And I think we collectively underinvest in policy in general um, in this space. So, so I think it was really exciting to see this first climate policy-based loan. And I think, you know, before commenting on the, on the, the loan in particular and um, that, that we were just discussing, you know, I think getting policy right for our goals is fundamental for so many reasons. To set the right ambition, right, because there's a role there, to create the conditions for the private sector to come in, we've talked about a lot, to create the preventive conditions, we were talking about prevention, investing in prevention, right? And then I would also add in terms of also having the right protections for people during the transition. So I think for all these reasons, policy is, is, is really critical, as, as would be my first point. Um, my second point would be um, that policy really needs to be tailored um, to each country, right? Because countries have different emissions pro uh, profiles, they have different market structures. We were talking actually um, earlier in my, my, uh, my bilateral with the Philippines government, we were looking at ETM in Philippines and Indonesia and just commenting on how they have such different market structures, so very public sector driven in Indonesia, very private sector driven in, in, in Philippines, and the response therefore also needs to be adapted. So I just want, so tailoring I think is, is, is really critical. Um, the other point I would make is um, the importance of really looking at se specific sectors when thinking about the policy res response. Right, um, and so whether it's transportation or agriculture, the hard to abate sectors, if you're looking at steel or cement, um, you really need to have that lens very clearly. And I would make a plea in general for um, in the process of developing NDCs, really keep making sure that the right uh, members of government and private sector representing all relevant sectors are actually at the table so that the NDCs can actually be really relevant to countries. So that's a bit of a parenthesis, but uh, I think it's important. Um, and then, and then, you know, we've had really fascinating discussions with uh, six major financial institutions that are GFENS uh, members who are interested in investing in Indonesia. And they were really clear, like they had a list of what needed to happen in terms of improving the enabling environment. And they, they, you know, and if, if these things are done, we will come in. You know, And so tackling some very thorny issues sometimes, including, for example, local content requirement, is something that we countries need to think about if they really want to unlock opportunities for the private sector. So really pleased um, to have supported uh, the, the PBL, Philippines PBL. Uh, for climate, um, I think it's a really good start. We want to see more of, of, of them. I would say I think it's really important that these PBLs um, really, really drive greater ambition, not confirm what was happening anyway. I think it's really important that they provide specificity about what the outcome of that greater ambition looks like and that it be able to measure that outcome in real ways. Um, and you know, there's some discussion around performance-based approaches where you're actually saying, you know, based on your NDC and what you want to do, if you achieve, whether it's GHG uh, emissions reduction, whether it's something about protecting a coastline, if you achieve, then you get paid. It's just another way to think about um, how to drive incentives as well. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Alexia and, and those comments on PBLs are one that would be familiar to people who heard the board discussion on that uh, proposal. Um, over to you, uh, Governor, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have, as, as Germany, um, been trying to help partner countries to achieve more ambitious NDCs. So on the backdrop of that experience, we really welcome um, this PBL to the Philippines, and I think it's going to be also for us, I mean, first and foremost, <laughs> Secretary, for you, but it's also going to, to be for us an, an interesting experience, and we hope that we can continue to mutually learn from our experiences. We believe that um, policy reforms, of course, are crucial. Um, but it sometimes, if we talk about it, sounds a little bit you know, to certain you know, parts of the population as kind of threatening. What does it mean for me? 
how is it affecting traditional ways of in, uh, ways of income and and how is it affecting the cohesion of society i think none of us can promise that it's not going to have an effect uh, but if we talk about for example reducing fuel subsidies that can scare people and we saw that in another um discussion about subsidies for um for for bread for example and for food um but if we can design a pbl in a way that we help a partner to get rid of in this case fossil fuel subsidies but also to emphasize that it's locking up resources and opportunities for other investments that's an entire different story and i think right now what we are already can see is a contours of a new kind of global market for example when it comes to green hydrogen um there's a lot of work to be done yet in terms of regulation but we already see that countries who have never been competing on the global market because of the ge geography because of their status of development um are in a way forgive me for using simple language but they are back in the game if we help them uh, to make the right decisions uh, and we as developed countries certainly will benefit but but if the design of what we are doing is the right one they are not only going to be exporters but there will be an opportunity to develop the own for example energy sector so um i think that's going to be crucial and um that's why i appreciate the opportunity to comment on that again tony thank you thank you so much um and thank you to our panelists our uh, second question for the second part of the panel goes to uh ivan and then i'll also get kentaro to uh, add on as well but um all governments both developed and developing are facing pressure on fiscal space it is therefore more important than ever that public resources are used and leveraged as effectively as possible and we've heard about this a bit already from a number of panel members in this regard how do you see adb's initiatives to develop innovative financing modalities if cap and etm but others as well is playing a role in accelerating climate action both in achieving more ambitious ngcs and more resilience against climate events ivan please okay uh, well i i started you know as a as a uh, researcher working for a central bank uh, the the workforce of central banks in particular last year during the g20 was specifically to try to think how to scale up finance towards emerging and developing countries exactly to boost uh, uh, the resources that are needed for the transition that is true for the sustainable finance working group that from the from the beginning has this topic this issue and and this issue is also more relevant under the indonesia presidency that specifically also set uh, in the report that is going to be published a set of principles for to uh, to in increase the involvement of uh, mdb and private finance for uh, for this this reason and also the network for getting the financial system has uh, started thinking about how to push for blended finance so the idea of having uh, you know funding from public sector multilateral banks philanthropic sources uh, th this can be a, an important the risking uh, facility to attract private in, in investment we were talking to increase that leverage that the uh, panel was talking before uh, the issue, and here I, 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 I connect what was Alexia was saying, is that all these initiatives, they call for sound and consistent policies. I mean, there's nothing that is going to substitute uh, um, uh, sounds and consistent policies. If I may, I think that, for example, initiatives like ETM, initiative also like the South Africa Joint Partnership, are really interesting. I want to make this analogy. You know, it's like when you're having an NDC or a general purpose, I mean, a single firm or a country say, I want to decarbonize. And then you have to set up a plan, for example, a transition plan for. That's another kind of story because you need intermediate objectives, you need clear uh, uh, strategies and uh, uh, action plans. 
I think the, both ETM, I mean, and and the, and the South African Joint Partnership, I mean, they 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 are made of these three things, no? Early retirement or, or coal power plants. So in a sense, try to manage the cost of stranded assets, anticipate the cost of stranded assets. Uh, second point, uh, setting up new energy sources that are substituting the, the coal power plants, renewables, uh, uh, increase energy efficiency, and all the things that we need to, for example, to uh, accommodate non-dispatchable energy in the power system, no storage uh, and this kind of stuff. Uh, and then manage also the social effects. Uh, I, I think that before was Niels that was thinking about no the social effects in terms, you know, the sector that are, for example, the coal sectors, the job, jo the job issues in the coal sectors, but in general also the issue of affordability. Uh, these things really are, they may seem uh, simple and, you know, and small, but uh, they really are a way to walk the talk. So I think that is there where we, we really are seeing that the transition is happening under our eyes, because they are, in a sense, if you want a practical translation of what is the idea of the just transition. So the transition must manage the stranded assets, the transition must set up resources to change the way we are producing using energy, hopefully using less energy, uh, so uh, in, in terms of increasing energy efficiency. And lastly, the, the transition at the same time must see that our policies are also designed to help the vulnerable. This means vulnerable in terms of houses, but also maybe some sectors or some firms that are really dependent on some kind of, you know, uh, let's say fossil-based energy sources. So I think that these initiatives, these, uh, for example, the ETM initiatives in the Philippines and in Vietnam, you know, though this, this let's say, Get starting points are really, really promising. And I would say that these are the real, the, the, the real way to go. Thank you very much for that, uh, Ivan. Let me turn back to Kentaro now to uh, add on on these points. Please, Kentaro. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the, the most of the, the points I would uh, like to, to mention was already uh, spoken. Um, so, I, I, as I said, the, the ETM and the IFCAP is really a innovative uh, instrument, but it's only a start. Uh, we may uh, be able to find another innovation. Uh, and as as uh, Tony, as you said, the, the uh, resources of the donors are limited, and we would like to spend the, the our uh, precious uh, resources most effectively and efficiently. Um, so the, the, our grant money, for example, has to be uh, used only on the, uh, the places where the only the grant money can do. Um, so the, the risking uh, and the, uh, the making the project bankable um, so that the, the, all the other financing uh, uh, can be mobilized. So the, the, w w w the ETM uh, if cap is really a good starting point, but it's not the, the only solution. There are also, the, as Alex mentioned, that the, the, there are policy responses uh, by the government uh, that is quite important. So the, uh, the, the government and the donors, everybody should cooperate and make the uh, environment that can facilitate the investment, uh, private investments. They, that that would be the be the the, the good uh, solution for uh, us to to utilize the use the our precious uh, uh, donor resources most effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Kentaro. And before we turn to questions from the audience, and we do have some uh, uh, questions before us uh, here. Let me just reopen the floor to all panelists um, because I only gave you a little bit of time to start off with. Just to come back on uh, or add to any of the points raised in the discussion so far. Um, there will be questions coming on, but this is your opportunity if anyone wants to come in. Tony, please. I just had some thoughts on um, involving private sector. I think that there is a great opportunity to do this at this point um, by using the renewed interest or the heightened interest in ESG and and to try and 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 articulate what might be included in ESG um, and add on perhaps a resilience at the end of ESG so that there is a there's a perspective of the future moving forward uh, in, in my own experience at the National Resilience Council, we've had the occasion to speak directly with corporations to actually work with local governments and with national government in co-spending for resilience. 
And I think there's a lot of space there that, that can be taken advantage of, um, both for local corporations as well as global corporations, in terms of what their role should be in the transitions that need to take place towards um, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. So I'd, I'd just like to bring that up because at the end of the day, um, our conversations have been rather, rather energetic, I would say, and, and interesting. And the private corporations are beginning to see that certain externalities may in fact need to be reflected in their balance sheets and how their core business value cycles must reflect these investments uh, both in mitigation and in adaptation uh, for the future. Thanks. Alexia, please. I might just make a quick point about something that I don't think we touched on very much, although I think it was embedded in Quintero's opening comment about opportunity. That's the new technologies of the future, the green technologies of the future, and would just make a plea for thinking through where MDBs can be helpful in, in that sort of R&D early startup and then scale up of solutions. It's not always a place that's easy for MDBs, but I, I do think there's a ton of opportunities down the pipeline and you know some we know about whether you know hydrogen innovations on ba on battery storage etc but i think there's things that we don't even know about yet that are, are are here to come and 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 what the role is as a as a as a almost sort of playing a, a vc investor role i think around green technologies or helping once they're out there scale up and bring them to emerging markets faster i think is the other piece to think about i think that's a critically important piece because the iea has said that the technologies that we need for the transition have not all been invented yet, so we really need to critically reduce the time period between when they are invented and DMCs are able to take them up. Uh, Rachel. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up Maria Antonia's points on the first mile. I agree it's the first mile, not the last mile, and take it to this issue of understanding risk. Uh, it seems very clear to us that the people with the best articulation and understanding of risk are the communities who live and breathe risk and climate risk day in, day out. They understand, they understand the early warning. Sitting in London, we're very close to the insurance industry and we're seeing this extraordinary revolution in how the industry is beginning to invest and model and understand risk. And we're seeing really interesting connections between the insurance industry and that first mile in gathering solid sort of credible risk information. And so I suppose I just wanted to join those dots because I think if we can join those dots, I feel that's where we've got this huge opportunity as we build these, uh, these structures that allow us to understand risk and therefore to price risk and therefore to shift and transfer risk away from vulnerable people and communities onto the international capital markets. And flipping that to start with the first mile, I think is going to be the thing that will kind of galvanize us to the next level. Okay, um, well, thank you uh, to the discipline shown by our panel members. We do have time for, I think, one question uh, that's come through to us from the audience. And I think what I'll do is I'll do that old trick of taking three questions and putting them into one. Um, but uh, if I look through some of the, uh, uh, the questions that are coming through to us, uh, it's talking about how AD ADB can in better engage with uh, donors, uh, don donor members, but also with um, borrowing members on how to increase the climate impact. But it's also saying how do we take all of these innovations and actually link them in with ADB's uh, sovereign lending model. And I think it does come back to a point that a number of panellists have said as well, that the traditional MDB uh, business model needs to shift. We've heard that this week in terms of ADB's organisation review. So maybe joining all of those things together, just how does ADB need to shift the way it's operating, both to hit its $100 billion target, but even more importantly, to help the region manage the um, transition that needs to be underway in a way that protects the vulnerable and brings community with it and with ownership of uh, DMCs. With that simple question that you can answer in one minute or less, uh, that'd be great. Any panel members who want to give a stab but you don't have to answer all of it, any elements of those questions that people may wish to add on as well? 
Niels? Niels, please. <laughs> it's a cold calling. Well, you know, you did ask to be on the panel, Niels, so, you know. <laughs> I'm happy volunteering. No, I, 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 I really think um, that we need to maybe, and MDBs need to team up more, yeah. also among each other. Because I have the impression we're having the discussion about our climate goals here at ADB. And I'm also um, Germany's governor for the IDB. Uh, pretty sure um, you see the same discussion here. Uh, we will have, and I mean, it's not, not a very risky um, prognosis um, when I say we're going to have the debate at the um, World Bank annual meeting as well. So I'm not against having different instruments, all the contrary. Um, we need to have solutions for different regions and countries. Um, but I think the, 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 the innovative power and the resources of our organizations have not <coughs> been really put to the test. Mm. And given the geopolitical tensions we are all witnessing, the pressure on ODA budgets, mm. but also the pressure on the, the political space that we need to bring those programs forward. Um, I, I would say we have been doing together a good job and ADB stepped forward with a very ambitious pledge. Um, and with innovative concepts like ETM, but I also would say it's not enough yet. Um, and we can only be successful if this is not only a debate between the leadership of the MDBs and the donor countries. That's not enough because we lack some of the specific knowledge um, that we need to create the um, adequate design. I will leave it with that. That's uh, well, excellent points, and I think it does really reinforce as well the need for ADB to reinvent itself as President Massa is going through the organisation review process, and that will play out uh, over a number of years to make that uh, fully uh, fully operational. But the sooner we start, the better. Um, colleagues, I think we have reached the end of the time, and we've reached the end of the week. Um, so thank you all, both on the panel and in the room and virtually, for sticking with us late on a Friday afternoon on what has been a big week. Thank you all very much for a, an incredibly rich and stimulating and inspiring conversation today. Here are some key takeaways from my perspective. We have seen that there is a broad consensus from a range of perspectives that there's an urgent need for action to address climate change but also that there's a significant opportunity that comes with that challenge. While much of the focus is on mitigation, panelists stress that adaptation is also important. Even if all emissions stop today, the cumulative impact of historical emissions will be with us until at least the end of the century. In addition, the issue of loss and damage isn't gonna get any easier, but it's not gonna go away. The challenge remains translating this goodwill into tangible action. Developing members need to be able to see climate finance as in line with their continued economic development. And there's a clear role for ADB and other MDBs to help navigate that path. The private sector needs to see that investing in the climate transition makes good economic sense because nothing, nothing unlocks investment more than the profit sign. All we, and we need to protect those, as many speakers said, who have the most to lose in the transition. It needs to be, and it needs to be seen to be a just transition, both because it's the right thing to do, but also because the political economy of reform means that necessary change won't happen unless it is. The discussion has shown that innovation is critical but also that it is not just about finding a single silver bullet, but bringing a diverse range of solutions, reflecting the diversity of challenges that we face, both within and across countries. 
while ADB is showing leadership through good, very good and welcome initiatives like IFCAP and ETM, we need more innovative uh, initiatives like this at ADB and in other MDBs. And many panellists pointed to the importance of not just blended finance, but also risk products and de-risking products, a range of those, uh, that area. There's general recognition that while ADB is very well placed to help Asia and the Pacific manage the challenges of climate change, it also needs to invest more in its climate expertise and capability to help with necessary policy and regulatory reforms to make the investments necessary for the region to adapt renewable energy at scale and with speed, and to bring tailored, innovative solutions to the issues facing individual members, including, as Alexia, you said, the critically important issue of technology transfer of newly uh, proven technologies, knowledge and practice to GMCs. So can you please all join with me in thanking all of our panel members and I would also like to thank all of the ADB staff working behind the scenes that made this event pos possible. With that, I draw the event to a close. Thank you, everyone.